Hi everyone. I've gotten several requests for flying stories in the comments section, so I thought I'd throw one out there now. For a fighter pilot, stories are usually about themselves and how they were heroes under some stressful situation. There's an old saying that says, the only way to know if a fighter pilot is lying is if his lips are moving. But anyway, I'm not the hero of this story. I am the pilot, and it's not a fighter. It was a civilian aircraft, and it is the absolute dumbest thing I have ever done while flying an aircraft. So it's taken me 30 years to come clean. I grab a cup of coffee. Let's watch some play from yesterday's weekly challenge grind, and we'll go for it. So I was in Australia. I was in the, well, let me back up. I was in the Air National Guard, a citizen soldier. A lot of people don't know that about a 50% of America's operational combat force is made up of citizen soldiers, guardsmen, and reserves. So I was in the Air National Guard and had to have a regular job while I programmed computers. In fact, I had written an application that took reams and reams and reams of aeronautical data, airport names, their ICAO identifier, their coordinates, the coordinates of the runways, the ends, the beginnings, either side, whatever, uh, obstructions in the area, those sorts of things. The data's in an international format, and it's just one record after another, and it's very complex. Well, I wrote a computer application that parsed that data and loaded it into a database so that then those people that design instrument approach procedures, maps for the in-flight jet routes, things like that, could use the data. And the Royal Australian Air Force bought that application. So I spent weeks at a time in Melbourne, Australia, working with the Royal Australia Air Force under contract. I love going to Australia, I love the people. They are laid back, they are flexible, they are friendly. So anyway, the CAA, Civil Aeronautics Authority and Administration in Australia heard about this application and they were interested in it for their own use. So they wanted to meet with me and meet with the Australians and the RAAF that were on the project to discuss it. My buddy, Australian buddy, Dave, was a lieutenant, a pilot in the RAAF, and he was leading this part of the project. So he said, let's go to Canberra together. In fact, I'm gonna start using an Australian accent because that is how I hear it in my head. It may be a poor one, but that's how I remember it. Please excuse that. So I show up at the airport in Melbourne and Dave said, good news, mate, we've rented an aircraft. And I thought, why not just go commercial? But he explained to me that being a pilot in a desk job, the Royal Australian Air Force has this, what I consider a brilliant program to issue credit cards to their desk flying pilots so that they can rent civilian aircraft and maintain flying proficiency. So good news, we're flying ourselves. And I said, fantastic. And he said, we've rented a, a uh, two-engine light Beechcraft. Said, okay, that's fine. He goes, but here's the problem, mate. Weather's dog's breakfast the whole way. He says, I don't have an instrument writing. Said, Wait a minute. I was an instructor pilot in Air, uh, Air Force pilot training, and all of our students graduate with an instrument rating, but... I do understand that maybe some Army pilots, some helicopter pilots who always flew in visual didn't need instrument ratings. And David flown the C-7 Caribou and the Royal Australian Air Force, uh, a larger twin engine aircraft, and he always flew in visual flight rules. So I'm thinking, how are we gonna get there if he doesn't have an instrument rating? Surely I'm not getting in this aircraft with somebody who doesn't have an instrument rating. And I said, well, that's bad news. He says, no, mate, good news is this. You're flying. And I'm thinking, what? I mean, I was in my suit and tie ready to brief the CAA Australia on this application that I'd written. There were three other or four other 
RAAF civilian civil servants that were going to go along on the flight, and there was Dave. And I thought, well, he just wants me to sit in the left seat to make this legal, but is it legal? I, and I asked him about that. And he said, well, Mike, you've got an instrument writing, right? I said, well, yeah, it's a commercial pilot instrument writing with the American FAA. Is that legal here? And he goes, oh, no worries, Mike. Of course it's legal. And I thought, okay. Well, Dave, how do you know that I haven't lied to you about this whole me being a fighter pilot thing about me having an instrument writing? Because I, I didn't have the license with me. I mean, I had the license, but it was at home in the United States. He goes, well, Mike, we'll figure that out after five minutes, right? I go, well, yeah, I mean, after we're smoking hole. He goes, no worries, Mike. So then I said, you just want me to sit in the left seat, right? No, mate, you're flying the whole way. I can't fly under instrument flight rules because I've not been trained. You know, oh, okay. I said, do you even know how to f fly this airplane? And I looked at it. It turned out to be a brand new, nice twin engine pressurized, thank God, airplane. In fact, it only had about 24 hours on the airframe, which meant it smelled like a new car when we got in. Oh, no worries, mate. I've got the checklist right here. So he sits me in the left seat, and, and I, I can't believe I was that easily fooled or conned or whatever into doing this. He gets the engine started. I taxi the thing out, and I take off. I'm not worried about flying it or taking off and landing. I mean, I've had my own light aircraft, not twin engine, I've flown everything from a biplane up to a Boeing 707 four-engine passenger plane. So I wasn't really worried about the flying part. I should have been worried about the en route part. So we immediately go into the clouds, and it is immediately bumpy. It feels like somebody's hitting the aircraft with sledgehammers. We're gaining altitude. We're losing altitude. We're just being thrown around. So we're on our way, and we're going to go over some of the higher terrain in Australia. There's not a lot of it, but we were flying over it. So I look out on the wings. We get up about 15,000 feet or so. I look out on the wings, and I notice that there's ice forming. Okay, dumbo me. I didn't check the weather. Pilot in command, which I technically was, is supposed to check weather. Dave, did you check the weather? Yeah, I might have already told you. It's going to be fine. I said, well, it's already not fine. Two things, turbulence and it's moderate. I hope it doesn't get severe. And we got ice building on the wings too. So this aircraft, does this aircraft have de-ice or anti-ice? It makes a difference. Don't know, mate. So he looks through the book, anti-ice, not, not good. So we turned it on and the ice is forming. We're starting to slow up a little bit. And I said, Dave, we've got to climb to get out of this ice. He goes, no, mate, we, we, we're at our ceiling right now. Uh, we can't legally go any higher. I go, watch me. So I push the throttle forward, throttles forward, and we start climbing. He goes, mate, we can't do this. I go, yeah, we can, because I wanted to get out of the weather if I could, number one. Number two, ice tends to go away easier the higher you go. So I took the radio. I called the controller, the Australian con controller, and I said, I'm declaring an emergency and I'm climbing. And of course the controller said, no worries, mate. As high as you need to go, I will keep people out of your way. So uh, very nice. So we're climbing and we could barely climb. That ice is forming, forming, forming. And if we had gone down like Dave thought we should do to try to get under the weather, which the weather went all the way down to the ground, then the ice would have continued to build and pulled us down until our flight was interrupted by the ground. So we're bumping, we're building ice, we're barely climbing because the ice on the wing is ruining our aerodynamics and it's heavy. Uh, so there are no atheists in the foxhole. I said a quick prayer, Lord, if you get me out of this, I will never do something this stupid again. So I thought about the prayer in my head. I thought about it for a second, then I added, Lord, please forgive me for lying to you just then. So anyway, we climb up, climb up. We are getting beaten to death. In the meantime, we hear from center that an aircraft is missing. Turns out an airplane crashed on our route of flight. 
okay, I didn't want to be the second one. So we climb, 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 we get up to an altitude, we're pressurized, it's okay. People in the back are puking. Uh, I can smell that coming forward, I'm getting sick, and I am just, my knees are shaking because I'm thinking, I survived the Gulf War in a fighter, and I'm gonna be killed by my own stupidity. So anyway, being dumb's deadly. Take that lesson away from this. So we climb up, and the ice starts to go away, and I'm just very, very relieved. Turbulence doesn't go away, and it's gotten worse. We are getting banged all over the sky. My head has gone off the uh, window on the side to the middle towards Dave, and Dave's just sitting there. Nobody's saying a word at this point, and when Aussies get quiet, you know there's trouble. I mean, it was dead silence. I had taken over the radios from Dave. I was talking to the controller. And so they, they head us towards Canberra, or we're already headed that way. And we descend, and thank God we didn't get any more ice coming down through the clouds. We fly an instrument approach. My wings are up on the side one way, then on the other. We're bouncing up, we're gaining 15 knots of airspeed and instantaneously losing it. So I decided I'd come in a little hot just in case we had a wind shear of decreasing tailwind that's dangerous. Commercial airliners have hit the ground because of that before. So we're on final and I'm thanking the Lord. He got me through my stupidity when a DC-3, and think of a DC-3, it's the same aircraft if you watch Band of Brothers that the Airborne jumped out of. It's a two engine, uh, propeller driven older aircraft can carry 20 to 40 people but it's a tail dragger and the wind crosswinds were so bad tail dragging is tricky on takeoff and landing well the thing ground looped meaning it turned in a circle due to the heavy crosswinds on the runway cracked a wing and it was dead in the water on the runway so the tower told me I couldn't land, that I had to go out and hold for about 45 more minutes while they towed the thing off the runway. And we were bouncing all over the sky. I was so sick. Everybody had already puked. Dave was fine. He was just sitting there bouncing around. Okay, so finally after 45, 50 minutes of just pure torture, tower tells us to come around and land. And when we were on final, we were bouncing getting hit with a sledgehammer. The wings were up, the wings were down. We were speeding up, we were slowing down. And touch down, nice and easy. We taxi in. Dave looked at me and goes, Kiwi, mate. He said, that wasn't so bad, now was it? And I was, my knees were, were literally shaking. That's a reaction to stress, you know? Uh, so I promised myself I'd never do something that stupid again. Uh, and I haven't, not in the air, not in the air, um, maybe some other ways, yes. But we went to the meeting, after the meeting the next day, it was just beautiful. The weather was beautiful, the air was smooth, uh, no clouds from here to the United States. I mean, beautiful. So Dave says, I'll take this one, mate. I go, oh, no, 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 you made me fly yesterday. I'm taking the easy flight back, and I did, and he didn't protest. Anyway, that's my story. If people like it, I'll give some more. Cheers, peace, see ya.